Hey everyone, myself Neha Gupta, your mentor for current affairs. So I welcome you all in this video, which is going to be helpful for your RBI SEBI NABAD examination. So I hope that my students are studying very hard for their examinations. And this video is going to help you in your exams only guys. So let's begin this video. But before that, uh, if you have not subscribed to our channel, then guys do subscribe and hit the bell notification because this is going to help you in staying connected with our channel because we are going to upload a lot of important videos for you only for the upcoming RBI grade B exam uh, sorry NABAD grade A and grade B examination and this is the telegram group which you can join if you have any queries and also here we provide you with quizzes so you can enjoy those quizzes on this group and the link of this group is in description below and this is the course for NABAD guys. We are launching this these courses at 40% discount. So if you want to avail that discount or if you want to get yourself enrolled in some kind of worthy course, then these courses are your destination. You can join any one of these courses if you have not covered your syllabus till now. So you can join these courses, okay? And if you have covered it, then you can revise the, uh, the entire course with the videos that we provide you on the YouTube or if you need any course then you can enroll in those courses. So let's begin today's video with this first news which is about carbon border tax. So this is going to be the world's first import pollution tax. So all the products that are imported in the Europe if they carry pollution or if their carbon footprint is high in which means in other words that if they are contributing a lot towards greenhouse gas emissions then those products will have to pay then those products will become expensive within europe now what does that mean that is something that we are going to understand in this first news only so let's first shed some light on the facts related to this carbon border tax then we go into the conceptual understanding of this tax so let's first discuss the facts Number one fact here is that by 2026, this tax is going to be levied by European Union on the imports. Okay, jitne bhi imports Europe mein hote hai, on those imports, this tax will be levied, as uh, European Union has said. The second fact here is that Europe aims to reduce its carbon emissions by 55% by the year 2030, and this is a significant step towards achieving that objective only third that this tax is not at all new this was uh, proposed by french president jacks jacks chirac who was the president in 1997 so he proposed that tax and in the year 2007 this tax uh, gained spotlight in the European Union and the European Union took it seriously and they started deliberations on this carbon border tax. So these are the facts related to this tax. So we have known this fact that this tax is not at all new. So why is it in news? I have already told you that because European Union has announced to implement it by 2026. Now it is going to be implemented in two phases, but that is something we can totally avoid. Okay just focus on the year by which they are going to implement this tax carbon border tax so first thing that you need to know about this tax for your understanding is that it is going to be levied on the products that are imported in europe that is the first thing second thing that the products which have higher contribution towards carbon emission basically the products that have a higher carbon footprint will have to pay a higher tax so tax will vary on the basis of carbon footprint that is the second fact for the conceptual understanding the third point that you need to understand here in order to understand this carbon border tax better is that it is going to encourage the countries to adopt clean technology methods in their production okay because the ultimate uh, goal here is to promote the sustainable development, promote clean energies because all the products that are imported in India, oh, sorry, imported in Europe, thikha, all those products, their carbon footprint will be analyzed right from the production stage. So 
the countries the countries that are producing those products will need to implement clean technologies if they want to avoid this tax in europe if they want to export their products in europe and they want to export it at a lower price by avoiding this levy they need to adopt clean technologies okay so in this way this tax is going to promote the idea of sustainable development clean and green energy so that is the three uh, that are the three broad purposes that have been uh, laid out by the carbon border tax now let us understand it bit by bit through these statements so the first statement states that under this tax mechanism you will uh, levy a tax on products which are imported in uh, imported from the other countries based on their carbon footprint so i have already told you this so thus products which involve high carbon emission during their production or consumption stage will have to pay a tax if it wants to enter europe so this is also understandable if the products are to be sold in the european market then they need to reduce their car carbon footprint okay next point that eu wants to encourage the world to adopt clean environmental production methods that we have already already discussed what we have not discussed till now is this that eu wants to encourage the world to avoid carbon leakage now what is the meaning of carbon leakage for example i am a steel manufacturer in india okay here the environmental laws are so strict that i plan to shift my production facility from india to bangladesh so this is going to help me avoid the compliances environmental law compliances this is called carbon leakage so the production facility the company changes its base and the production facility entirely to another country which has loose uh, like environmental laws in order to avoid the environmental compliance that is called carbon leakage that will be avoided through this tax because here ultimately what is being taxed the product the product's entire carbon footprint right from the production stage so how does it matter whether i am producing the steel in india or in bangladesh ultimately the entire process of making the steel will be assessed and on that basis the tax will be levied so that is why that is how basically carbon leakage will be avoided through this carbon border tax okay that is one thing the next point here is that this will give a competitive advantage to europe's domestic companies obviously if the steel imported from india to europe uh, will suffer through this levy obviously that steel will become expensive in comparison to the domestic steel that is being produced in europe only so in order to avoid that competitive advantage uh, eu needs to implement strategies carbon emission cuts limits on carbon trading etc because otherwise all the countries as well as companies are going to make a fuss and they are going to oppose this carbon border tax otherwise also the implementation of this tax is not at all easy because of the wto rules so there is a, a, a very voluminous set of guidelines for uh, for carrying out the global trade by, and that has been laid down by world trade organization so in order to surpass those guidelines and implement this uh, this tax is in itself a challenge for the european union and how is it going to do that let's see by the time but for the time being just remember all the things that i have told you not remember basically understand the things that i have told you and i hope that you are able to understand it because there is nothing much okay to it they don't make it complex by mugging up all these facts just try to understand border refers to the imports so all the imports that are going to be entered into the that are going to be sold in europe will have to suffer through this carbon border tax and in order to prevent other companies from laying a finger on european union only they need to have some strategies to keep the competitive advantage in check for its domestic companies as well so that is all about this carbon border tax i hope that you have understood it now i am moving on to the first question itself with which of the following organizations has ministry of electronics and information technology signed an mou for enabling 
map services in Umang application. Google Bhuvan Map India, Map My India, Bharat Map Survey of India. So which company is it? It is Map My India. With Map My India, this MOU has been signed. So basically, from now onward, in the Umang application, if you are using the Umang application, then you would know this thing. But those who don't know this, know, who do not use this application, so they need to know this thing that uh, from now onward, you will get map service as well on this Umang application. So what is the purpose of this Umang application, basically? Why this application was launched? Basically, what is the function? It provides you with the government services. So all the government services are provided through this Umang application and it makes it easier for us to avail those services by using the mobile application by sitting at our homes instead of standing in the long queues in the government offices like we used to. But now this process has been eased out by launching this Umang application. So when was this application was, la was launched? It was launched in 2017. This Umang has a full form. What is the full form? The full form is Unified Mobile Application for New Age Government. This is the full form of Umang application. You can divide the word in order to understand or remember this full form better. U for Unified, MA for Mobile Application, NG for New Government, Government New Age Government. Okay, so in this manner, you can divide this entire full form and memorize it better for your upcoming examination. Okay, so that was all. Now let's move on to the second question. How much FDI has been allowed in the pension fund management by government of India? So this is again a very important question from your exam point of view. So how much FDI has been allowed in the pension fund management sector? It is 74% now. Earlier, 49% was the limit. So, Pension Fund Regulatory Development Authority Act 2013 has been amended in order to raise this limit of FDI in this pension fund management sector. Guys, in the beginning of this year only, insurance sector's FDI limit was also raised by the government and that limit was also 74% from 49%. And at that time only, the government has announced to raise the uh, FDI in pension sector as well in the monsoon session and they have done it right now. Can you guys tell me that which act was amended in order to bring this uh, FDI limit in the insurance sector? This is your task that you have to mention in the comment section below. Okay, the next question is which bank has signed an MOU with NABAD to boost ongoing development initiatives linked to priority sector lending in Maharashtra. So Gopinath Patil Parsik Janata Sehkari Bank, Central Bank of India, United Overseas Bank, DVS Bank, Bank of Maharashtra. So Bank of Maharashtra is the right answer here. Now guys, this MOU is going to boost the initiatives that are already there, that are already ongoing in this state of Maharashtra. Okay, all those initiatives that are linked to priority sector lending. So I hope that majority of you would know what priority sector lending is, but those who don't know, let me tell you that priority sector lending is basically a certain percentage of the total credit of banks that banks are required to keep or to provide to certain sectors. For example, MSMEs for women empowerment, for education, for farmers, for startups. So if the percentage or the amount that is mandated by RBI that the banks have to set aside for giving to certain sectors for their empowerment is called priority sector lending. See, yeah? that is priority sector lending. So all the product, all the initiatives or the projects that are already linked to this priority sector lending in Maharashtra, they will be boosted through this MOU. Now, how is it going to be done? Because this is just one single bank and how many projects can a single bank implement in the entire state of Maharashtra? So now here the role comes of the role of state level banking committee comes.
So this SLBC, right now Bank of Maharashtra is the convener of this SLBC and by virtue of being the convener of this committee, this bank is going to promote the priority sector lending based projects in Maharashtra that are already ongoing. Okay? That is one part. That is one thing. Now what is this state level banking committee? This is very important from your exam point of view, even if it is RBI, SEBI or NABAR. Now, so now let's understand this state level banking committee. <coughs> the very first thing here is that each state and union territory has one bankers committee and it came into effect in 1977. So it is the uh, idea of having such banking committee is way back old since 1977. The purpose is basically this committee is an inter-institutional forum that was created for ensuring the coordination between the government and the banking sector. Okay? So it involves the banks, the government and the banking officials and it also has representatives from RBI, NABAD and the government department so that they can, uh, go, they can sit together and discuss their issues out. Also, the uh, industries, uh, industry representatives also take part in these committee meetings so that their issues can also be heard and resolved. The next point here is that it is chaired by the chairman and MD or the executive director of the convener bank. So at present, the chairman of Bank of Maharashtra is the chairperson of this SLBC for Maharashtra. Your task is to tell me who is the present chairman of Bank of Maharashtra in the comment section below. This we have already discussed. The meetings are held on quarter, quarterly basis and the responsibility for convening this SLBC is the um, responsibility of SLBC convener bank of the state. Guys, this point is important that the meetings are held on quarterly basis. So a question can come up on this as well. So that was all about the state level bankers committee as well as the MOU between Bank of Maharashtra and NABAT. Now ne next question is who has been appointed as the chairman of Internet and Mobile Association of India? Vipul Bansan, uh, Bansal, Sanjay Gupta, Amrish Sharma, Surat Prakash Sharma, Prakash Chan. Right answer is Sanjay Gupta, who is the MD and Vice President of Google India at present. Okay? So that was the fact that you need to know about Sanjay Gupta. Next is who has been awarded the UNDP Equator Prize 2021 from India. So you have been given the three options, three organizations and these two options. The right answer is option B, both A and B. That is this Adi Malai and whatever this is pronounced, you can pronounce it on your own. So this Adi Malai Producer Corporation and Sneha Kunja Trust, these two organizations have won this award. So let me first tell you that this organization works in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve in Tamil Nadu. And this works in the Western Ghats and the coast of Karnataka. So these are the operational fields of these two organizations. Now, what is the purpose of this award? Because if you understand why this award is given, then you will definitely understand what these organizations do. So basically this Equator Prize, first of all, it is a biennial award given, in, given once in two years. Okay? Now this is given to a community or an organization working for the community. Okay? That is another thing from this Equator Prize. Now the award is given to the organization or the community for, uh, for using the resources, using the biological biodiversity resources in a sustainable manner to alleviate poverty of that community. Okay? That is why this UNDP Equator Prize is given. So first purpose is using the resources sustainably and second purpose is using that to remove the poverty among the people. That is why this equator prize is given. Now this Abdi Malai organization has been given this prize because in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, all the people, all the indigenous people that reside in that community, community this organization basically market their produce, market 
or sell their products in uh, the in the urban markets we can say or in the markets that offer them premium prices so this is basically a cooperative cooperative of 1700 farmers this is 1700 yes so this is a cooperative of 1700 farmers they uh, they come together and they sell their products okay so that is the function of this uh, Adi Malai producer organization that works in Nilgiri Barsia reserve area in Tamil Nadu and the next point here is that the Sneha Kunja Trust so this basically works for the conservation of this area as well as provide the Uh, employment opportunities or the livelihood opportunities for the people residing in those areas. So that is the whole purpose of giving this UNDP Equator Prize. Now you don't have to memorize all of it, neither the total members of this cooperative is because some of you might have been memorizing this number as well. This is just for your information guys. You don't need to memorize such minute informations because they are not going to be asked for you. The major point here is that these two organizations have won this award from India. In total, total 10 organizations have won the award, two from India and eight from other countries. Not at all important from your exam point of view, just these two are important. Okay. So that was all for today. I hope that you have learned something during the video. And if you have, then do subscribe and like this video.